Welcome to day one of the Specific Aims Accelerator. Welcome, welcome. As everybody is getting settled into the space, let me know in the chat where hey, hey, you everyone. are joining welcome from. Welcome to day one uh, of the Specific gonna do Aims Accelerator. I'm going to do is mute well, myself here because we are live streaming on uh, YouTube right now. So, uh, yeah, so you won't hear that echo anymore. I just muted myself on YouTube. Uh, yeah, but let me know uh, where you are joining from in the chat. You're all familiar with Zoom at this point, so uh, you should know how the chat works. And if you have any questions uh, during the lesson today, feel free to put them in the Q&A box uh, so that uh, we can find them pretty easily, okay? Those are the standard housekeeping uh, announcements before we get started. But uh, yeah, we do have lots and lots of folks joining today. So um, yeah, please do uh, let me know where you are joining from in the chat and I'm gonna pull up my slides and we will get started. First things first though, can you hear me? <laughs> let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Uh, and um, that's that's the first thing we need to, to double check here. Thumbs up. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, I'm gonna pull up my slides. Um, oh, the chat is the chat is disabled. Sorry, everybody. That's my bad. We'll have that fixed for tomorrow. Um, but uh, or maybe we can have that fixed if we have uh, Tamiza on the call or Lindsay on the call at the moment. But um, we're just going to use the the Q and A box. We will um, we will make this work. But thanks everybody. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to pull up my slides and we are going to get started. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, here we go. Can you see my slides? Thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to go full screen with that and we are going to dive right in to day one. Uh, I just want to let you know that the lessons that we have for this accelerator are designed deliberately to be short. And that is because we want you to stay focused. We want you to focus on kind of one thing every day over the next five days. Uh, and we want you to take action quickly, right? So it's one thing to just sort of passively ingest uh, a lesson, and it's quite another to actually dive in and do the work. And so the reason this is called an accelerator is because we want you to actually dive in and do that work. So the lesson we're going to keep hopefully to about 15 or 20 minutes, then we'll have lots of time for questions. We've booked a full hour today, but we're going to see if we can keep that to 45 minutes so that you can go off and spend those final 15 minutes uh, doing your homework. And then you'll only have to find maybe another 15 minutes uh, after that to complete it. But we really do want this to be impactful. We want it to be efficient. And of course, we want it to be fun. Uh, I always want you to uh, enjoy yourself as you're doing this, because as you will learn, one of my philosophies is that your job is to get your reviewer as excited as you are about your science. And if you're not excited to start with, it's really hard to uh, convey that in your writing. Okay, so that is uh, that is just a little side note on how the, the accelerator is going to go this week. If you have any questions about that, um, you can put that in the Q&A and we can talk about that towards the end. But let's dive into the material for today. So on day one, we're talking about why are we starting with your AIMS page? All right. Why do we start here? Why is it important to start here? And so today you're going to learn why it's important to start with this one pager, why you don't need to have all the science figured out before you start writing your AIMS page. And you're also going to learn the four key sections of a stellar specific AIMS page and why to arrange them in that particular order. All right. That's what we're doing. So I think most of you are probably familiar with me already, but in case we have some newcomers here, I'm gonna introduce myself quickly. I am Sarah Dobson. I am a health research grant consultant specializing in applications to NIH. My team and I help primarily early career researchers get funded at NIH. I've been doing this for a while. At this point, I've reviewed probably hundreds of applications. So I know what I'm talking about, all right? Especially when it comes to 
really grabbing your reviewers by the shoulders uh, on your aims page. And not only do I know what I'm talking about, but I have trained my editorial team to be able to review aims pages and provide that level of advice and recommendation, the same level of advice and recommendation that I do. So this is tried and tested and true. We know what we're doing. We know what we're talking about. And so this week, we are teaching you that. We're teaching you what we know about how to write a really, really great AIMS page. Okay. So number one, why do we start with your AIMS page? You should only start writing your full NIH application once you're confident that you have a solid conceptual foundation for your research, okay? Getting early feedback on that high-level concept of your research idea is the most efficient way to move forward. Since you already need to provide that high-level conceptual overview of your proposed project in your specific AIMS page, it is smart and efficient to start by drafting your AIMS page so that you, first of all, can get clear on that conceptual overview. The early feedback that you get on your AIMS page should help you confirm, number one, that your research idea is compelling, and number two, that your research idea is a good fit for your target funder's priorities. So some words of wisdom for you here. Using your AIMS page as the blueprint for your full proposal will save you from getting too attached to a poorly or incompletely conceived idea. Use your AIMS page as a starting point to solidify your research idea. In other words, you don't have to have all of the science figured out before you start writing your AIMS page. Writing your AIMS page is how you figure out the science, okay? You, you want to have an idea to start with, but figuring out sort of the big picture connection between the, the problem that you're trying to solve and how you're going to go about solving it, that is something you can do as you are drafting your AIMS page. Okay, so the reason that I think that this is so important is that a few years ago, I interviewed a bunch of R01 applicants, some of whom had been successful and some of whom hadn't been successful. And I noticed some really interesting differences between them. So the ones who weren't successful said, I required too much time to get the grant into a shape where it could be reasonably criticized by others, right? <laughs> if this sounds familiar to you, give me a thumbs up. If you are kind of reluctant to send your writing out for feedback until you think that it is perfect or as close to perfect as yeah look at look at all those look at all those uh thumbs up you you know this right you and it's normal to be uh sort of reluctant or nervous about putting your work out into the world but remember that if you don't do that early enough in the process you can end up going down some pretty deep rabbit holes uh, and wasting a lot of time, right? So it's so important to kind of sketch things out conceptually and get feedback at that stage before you actually dive into writing this massive time-consuming application, right? So again, here's what someone else said. If you're doing it the way that I do it now, you're getting so married to your idea because you spent so much time on it but you probably won't see fundamental issues anymore or opportunities to spin things in a different way. So this is kind of you know the the other half of that previous statement, right? Is you're getting you're just getting really attached to an idea and because you've spent so much time with it, which means for one thing you can't see the flaws in it when you're so far in it, but also you've committed all of this time and effort and energy into into writing this thing that you're now so attached to that you're really reluctant to make any changes. It's like um it's like sunk costs, right? So Again, this is another great example of why it's so important to get feedback early on in the process at that conceptual level, okay? Um, so this is what someone who on the other side was, was successful. Um, and they said, what I did was I kind of put out a, a sort of an architecture that can be changed instead of a final building. So that's that idea of the blueprint, right? You're creating a blueprint rather than building the building right from the get-go. Um, and because you are only starting with a blueprint, it's a lot easier to change a blueprint than it is to, you know, destroy a building and build it back up again, right? 
All right. Number two. So along the same vein, I want to talk a little bit before we actually dive into the, the specifics of, of an AIMS page. I want to talk a little bit about developing your research ideas. So, of course, I am expecting that most of you have come to this accelerator with at least the, you know, the germ of an idea. Right. Um, you don't have to have your AIMS page written, of course, but but I, I am expecting that you're coming with an idea. But I do want to talk a little bit about developing a research idea because I think it's really important to kind of remember what what we're trying to accomplish here. Right. So scientific literature is a conversation. This is something that I learned from my mentors many years ago. And I think it's really important to look at it in this way because it it actually takes away some of that pressure around um, showing your work to others, even in early stages. Okay, so advances in science ultimately come through communicating and disseminating the results of your research. Your contributions to science are part of an ongoing dynamic conversation with your peers. You engage with the work of others as you make the case for your own research. To justify why your research needs to be done, you must find a way to join the conversation in a way that brings something new and important to the table. So you want to ask yourself, what is the contribution that I want to make to this conversation? And here's the analogy that my mentors used with me, which I think is so helpful. And, and so just imagine yourself at a cocktail party, right? everybody's in this big room and there are lots of little conversations happening kind of in, in smaller pockets, right? So the first thing that you need to do is eavesdrop to figure out which of those conversations you actually want to join, right? And if we look at that uh, analogously in the literature, that's like doing a literature review, right? You're eavesdropping, you're sort of reading the literature and trying to figure out which conversations are most interesting to you. And then the next stage is to actually contribute to that conversation, right? So how do we actually do that? Well, we signal a shared interest. We acknowledge what's already been said. And then we add something new that matters to those participating in the conversation. All right. So again, when we're thinking about this in terms of contributions to the literature, or, you know, grant writing, which sort of would precede uh, contributions to the literature, you're you're thinking about it in terms of like, how do I know that these people uh, who are in this conversation share the same interests that I do? And how do I indicate to them that I'm interested in the same things that they are? Well, we do that really by identifying a big problem that everyone cares about, right? And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. And in fact, we'll talk about it throughout this week, right? But you also want to acknowledge what's already been said. So you're not coming in here and saying like, guess what, everybody? Uh, I have something that I want to say when it's already been said before, right? You want to acknowledge what's already been said, or, you know, again, from a, from a literature perspective, you want to acknowledge what's already been, been done or established or um, kind of where, where the um, important points in the conversation are actually happening right now, right? And then you want to add something new, again, that matters to those who are participating. So it's really about identifying that audience and figuring out what really matters to them. And of course, that comes into play when we're talking about the study sections, the peer review groups that we are submitting these grants to. You want to make sure that you are speaking directly to those reviewers and um, pointing to their interests and aligning with their interests. And again, this is something that um, we will get into uh, a little bit more later this week. But the idea there is to is to make sure that what you are talking about matters to your audience, that they really care about the same things that you care about. And so figuring out who those people are and figuring out what, what those problems are that they care about is, is really, really important to writing a competitive application and to making that contribution to science, to the literature. Okay, so again, just to underline this, finding a conversation to join and figuring out the contribution that you wanna to make to that conversation is a crucial part of developing your research idea. 
All right, so now we're getting into sort of the big picture overview of how to structure your AIMS page. So this one is about your specific AIMS page section by section. So the way that I like to think about this is you're always moving from broad to specific, but then kind of towards the end, you're pulling back a bit and um, kind of zooming out a little bit so that we can see the big picture again, now that we have sort of a kind of a solution in mind. And so the reason that we want to move from broad to specific is because that's how humans naturally understand expository or persuasive writing. We need context for what we are reading before we can get to that next level of detail. And so that's why we want to make sure we're always starting with sort of the broad introduction and significance of what we're doing. And then we're narrowing down into our goals and objectives. And then we're narrowing even further into our aims. And then once we've, once we've described those clearly, we zoom out a little bit and we talk about outcomes. So how do we, what, what do we expect is going to happen when we do all of these things? And how does that tie back to the significance of what we're trying to do in the first place? So again, we're going to get into much more depth on this over the course of the week, but I just wanted to introduce you to the, the basic structure that we're trying to go for here. So just to put a fine point on this, you want to divide your aims page into four sections. So you want the first section to be about the, the background, the context, the significance. You want the second section to be about goals and objectives. You want the third section to be your aims and your general approach. And you want your fourth section to be outcomes and impact. Okay, those are the four sections that we're going to be working through. Okay. Now we're on to your homework. So for this week, I want you to think about the big scientific challenge or problem you want to contribute to solving. What is the conversation in the literature about that problem? Where do you want to contribute and add to the conversation? And then I want you to jot down some notes about what belongs in each of the key sections of your AIMS page. So significance, objectives, aims, and outcomes. And that's what we're going to work on uh, tomorrow and for the rest of the week. Uh, but that is the lesson for today. If you have any, uh, oh, well, I'll get to tomorrow in a second, but I just want to pause for questions. So if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And uh, we, I will answer those for you. Please show the second to last slide again. Okay, sure. I will pull that up. All right. Uh, let me pull that up again. Okay, second to last slide. I, was it the one with the uh, categories? Is this the one here? Let me just go full screen for a second. All right, so I'll give you the four sections again, and then I'll give you the homework again. Your homework is also in your daily email that you get, um, so it's listed there for you. And when we send you, we're going to send you an email later on once this recording is available in the uh, program area, and we'll reiterate your homework there. So don't worry, there'll be plenty. <laughs> we're not going to let you forget about your homework, all right? That is for sure. Okay, so again, you want to divide your AIMS page into four sections. You want first section, context and significance. You want second section to be goals and objectives. You want your third section to be aims and general approach, and your fourth section to be outcomes and impact. I do not expect you to do all of that by tomorrow. This is what we're working on for the rest of the week, okay? Tomorrow, I just want you to have some ideas about what belongs in each of those sections, and we're going to focus on context and significance tomorrow, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you the homework again. So I want you to think about that scientific challenge or problem that you want to contribute to solving. 
what is the conversation in the literature about that problem? Where do you want to contribute and add to that conversation? What are you going to be building upon? And then the third part of the homework is to jot down some notes about what belongs in each of those four sections, right? So what belongs, what do, you, what do we need to know about the significance of your project? What do we need to know about the objectives? What do we need to know about the aims? What do we need to know about the outcomes? These are really just rough notes, okay? Because we are going to be building on each of these sections for the rest of the week. Okay, lots of great questions. So is everybody is everybody okay? Uh, can I can I stop sharing and focus on the um, focus on the questions? Okay. So for some of these questions, I'm going to remind you that we are working on these throughout the week. So there are a lot of questions about the difference between aims and objectives. Be patient, my friends, we will get to that. Um, we will get to the distinction uh, around aims and objectives. Um, for now, what I want you to do is put down your best guess for what each of those things are. And we're gonna talk about how to think about those things in subsequent lessons. But again, I wanna remind you that the reason that we are breaking this into smaller components is to keep you focused. You're all jumping ahead, okay? So. Um, I'm going to be a bit of a benevolent dictator here and tell you to just hold your horses. Um, we will get to it. Okay. Uh, again, so a question about how much preliminary data do we need in the specific aims page? Uh, that is something that we're going to cover when we get to the goals and objectives section. So we are going to put a pin in that one. Um, but the the short <laughs> Coles Notes version is we we really only have room for kind of one or two sentences about preliminary data in the actual aims page. So you're going to have to be super selective about what that actually um, what that actually looks like on your aims page versus what ends up in your full application. OK. Um, OK, so having specific aim written in more of a layman's terms is advisable or rather to be very scientific. OK. Oh, OK, I see what your question is. Um, yeah. So. That, that's a really good question. And the question again is, do you want your aims page to be written in more sort of layman's terms or is it advisable to be very scientific? Um, and first of all, I wanna sort of dispel the myth that, um, that um, very scientific is not approachable um, or uh, understandable by, um, by an educated reader that isn't an expert in your field. So what I want you to remember here, all of you, is that your aims page is meant to be a snapshot of your entire project on a single page, right? So there's only so much you can describe. So you really do have to be uh, selective uh, and you have to be strategic about what ends up on that aims page. But what you also have to do in your aims page is, is generate that enthusiasm uh, for your reviewers to go and read more and, and to really, and, and enthusiasm comes in part from them being able to grasp pretty quickly and pretty easily what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And the best way to do that is to write as clearly and simply as you can. That does not mean that you are dumbing anything down or you are not describing things in a scientific way. That's not what that means. All that means is that you are being very careful about the assumptions that you are making about what your readers already know about what you are describing, okay? Because remember, like we talked about in those early slides, it's really easy when you are writing a grant to, for, it's really easy to forget that people aren't as immersed in this world as you are. Okay, even if they're reviewing your grant and you perceive them to be experts. And that's still true. They are they are experts and they do obviously have uh, you know experience uh, that's closely related to the the research that you're proposing. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been asked to review your application. But all that 
said, remember that they are not familiar with your specific project that you are proposing, right? They're seeing this for the very first time. And so it's your job to make it as easy as possible for your reviewers to grasp quickly what it is that you are trying to accomplish. That's your goal with your aims page. You want them to be able to see what you are proposing to do, and you want them to be excited about that. That's really the bottom line with your aims page. And so I, I want to get away from this idea of like layman versus scientific and, and focus more on clarity and simplicity, which is very scientific, right? The, the more clearly and simply you're able to communicate your research, the more it will be able, like it, it's going to be easier for everybody to understand and appreciate what it is that you're doing. So we always want to focus on clarity and simplicity, especially on your aims page, but truly everywhere that you are communicating, where you're writing about your science. Okay. All right, so difference between aims and objectives, we will get to that. Um, how does someone know whether they're proposing too much work for the R01 proposal? We're going to get to that a little bit when we get to the writing the aims section. Um, so if you've ever had a comment about your application being too ambitious, this that one's for you. Uh, and that's coming up. We are Monday. That'll be Thursday. Uh, that we're going to talk more specifically about that. Um, but the, you know, the Coles notes of that is you, you really have to make sure that you are clearly connecting your overall objectives for the project with your aims. And, and all of that is happening within um, the, the term of the grant that you are proposing, right? But again, we'll get into that more on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, what if you have multiple potential ideas for topics? What is a good strategy for deciding which to pursue? Great question, Beverly. Um, the, the best way to think about that, um, and actually we'll, we'll get into this a little bit tomorrow, when, when you think about the, the big picture problem that you are trying to solve, you can look at it in sort of a like a trajectory. Um, if we're talking about sort of getting closer and closer to being able to solve a, a big, big problem, you can look at it in sort of the order that that needs to happen, right? But sometimes these things are happening in, in parallel um, and there's lots of different ways to approach solving a problem and that's where all of those ideas are coming from. If that's the case for you, the question that I would invite you to ask yourself is what has the most juice? For you like what what gets you most uh excited and most interested like where 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 does the passion really lie for you in in what you want to pursue um and if the question is all of those things then it's really just like there's no there's no wrong answer right there's there's no wrong answer it's just what which one do you want to start with but if there's one out of all of those long list of ideas that um that is really appealing to you I would I would really check in with yourself and ask which one is the most appealing, um, or you know you may have potential collaborators that you're really excited about working with, and and that might be the one that you decide to go after. That's you know there are, there are lots of different ways to figure out where where your enthusiasm lies, but that that is the place to look in my opinion is what's what's going to be the most fun, what's going to be the most exciting. Uh, Sarah's asking, I'm hearing more and more about two aim application rather than three for early career investigators. What are my thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are that if you try to game the system by trying to figure out how many aims um, are in a, you know, belong in an R01, that's that's the wrong way to look at it. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that that's what you're doing, Sarah. I'm suggesting that the advice that you're getting is probably not great. Um, so the way that I recommend that you look at this, and again, this is something that we're going to be talking about throughout the week, is what does your project need, right? When you think about the overall, like the overall objective of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to go about accomplishing that, what, what does your project actually need? Does it need two aims? Does it need three aims? Again, all within the context of the, the term of the grant. So what can you reasonably get done? 
during the, you know, the four or five years that you have to work on this, right? So that's the other piece too, because of course, we're always looking at feasibility. That's a big part of the equation, but, but don't start with like, how many aims should I have? Start with what's like, what is the gap that I'm trying to fill and how am I going to go about doing that? And how many aims do I need to do that? And, you know, the, the content of your project is going to dictate the structure. Okay. Um, how many details are generally optimum in terms of methods and techniques and actual experiments? Um, again, this is going to depend on the specifics of your project, but remember that you only have a page and we went through those four sections. You need to make sure that the reviewers have an, uh, a clear idea of what's, you know, what's going on in each of those sections, right? And so there's not going to be a ton of room for detail. So what you need to do always is trust that what you're providing in your aims page is going to be sufficient for the reviewers to want to to keep reading and to learn more about what you're doing and of course you know they are they 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 have to do that right they're you know they signed up to review your entire grant and they are going to read the whole thing but the level of enthusiasm with with which they read the entire thing is going to depend a lot on how you describe your project in that aims page so there, there isn't a lot of room for a lot of detail, which is why you have to be really selective about the detail that you include. And again, this is something that we'll talk about when we talk about the aims. And that, again, is happening on Thursday. Uh, hypothesis, where to put the hypothesis? Be patient, my friend, we will get to that. Uh, Elizabeth asked at a high level, can you delineate between goals, objectives, and aims? I think those, uh, I think of all of those as being fairly synonymous. So Elizabeth, yes, you're right. They are fairly synonymous, but we are using them in very specific ways in this application. And we'll start getting into that uh, on Wednesday. So hang tight. We're just, we're going to try to stay as focused as we can. I know it must be so frustrating to just like want all the answers. Um, but again, we're trying to stay really focused here on kind of building this step by step so that you really, um, you can really see how it all comes together. All the, all the puzzle pieces. Okay. Um, Uh, there's a pretty good guide to a specific aims page I found on this website that I've used with success. Next time, could you tell us what could be improved off of their template? Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, review someone else's aims page on uh, during this session. Um, I'm, you know, if I'm sure that one is very helpful. Um, and obviously, it's helped you before. Uh, I have a very specific structure that I'm using, um, and if you want to sort of take that one and, and see what parallels there are, um, you're more than welcome to. Brian says, I feel like examples of significance are usually based on disease impacts, but often this feels only tangentially related when the research project is more basic or fundamental. Do you have any suggestions about how to, how to approach significant statements for research that isn't primarily disease oriented? Yes, and that is exactly what we're covering tomorrow. So that first section, um, I have a framework that I use for um, how to describe the, the, the value and the significance and the importance of your research. And that's what we're going to be covering tomorrow. Um, and it works for virtually any application. So when we review grants, we, we review, you know, basic science all the way through to like intervention research, like clinical research. And it, it works in every scenario. Obviously, you know, there's an art to making it work for the particular project itself, but the framework is really useful in terms of how to think about how to how to structure that and how to convey those different parts. So we will get to that tomorrow, Brian. Um, why is it hard to formulate the third or last aim? Uh, or am I the only one? Um, you know, I, like it's it's always going to be tricky right when you're when you're in that sort of development process and i don't want to um i don't want to sort of paper over that it 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 can be really tricky but what i want you to get out of today's lesson is that you your aims page can actually be a place where you play with things and you figure it out and um it's not it's not something that you write at the end after you've written your entire application. It's a way to get clear on what it is that you're doing. 
and get feedback on your aim so that that third aim is just as powerful as the two that preceded it, right? That's, um, that's what is possible for you here. Uh, I always find the differences between goals and objectives to be a bit unclear conceptually. For example, in the workbook, did you mean that addressing section one is a long-term goal and addressing section two is the objective? Um, oh, you're getting way ahead. I promise we will get to that tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, the difference between goals and objectives and aims. You, By the time we get to the end of this week, that will be absolutely clear to you, I promise. And if it's not, you can ask me more questions. But again, we're trying to stay focused today on why we start with the aims page, the value of starting with that, and, and the possibility that opens up for you when you use the aims page as a blueprint to really figure out what it is that you're doing. Um, will we cover how to make sure aims are independent? Yes. I mean, conceptually, right? We're going to talk about that conceptually, but yes, we will definitely talk about that. Um, you talked about going too far down a rabbit hole, needing something to be perfect before you send it to others for input, similar, but a bit different. What is your advice for people who can't seem to get going because all you see are flaws? It's not about perfection, but anxiety to get started. That is a really, really good question and, and really common, right? Just that anxiety about getting started. Um, one of the things that I have observed in the years that I've been doing this is that there can be a real um, that there can be a real fear of peer review, right? About putting your work in front of others in a formal way, but that that also kind of bleeds into fear <laughs> um, fear of of criticism more generally, right? That and it's again, this is so, so normal in, in academia, because we're doing a lot of this alone, um, because there is this myth of, you know, being sort of a lone wolf and being independent, even though, you know, everybody keeps talking about team science, team science, there's still this myth of, you know, the individual genius, right? And so there can be a lot of fear and, um, like self-protection around not wanting to show people that you haven't got it all figured out yet. I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is we always look to those who are more senior than us and try to emulate what they're doing. But at the same time, we forget that they've had a lot more experience, a lot more practice, a lot more um, time to solidify their programs of research and looking at someone's middle when we're at the beginning is just going to make us feel terrible. So there's that part of it as well. And that, yeah, and, and coupling that with sort of general, generalized imposter syndrome, right? It's, um, it's, it's a recipe for um, looking at, looking at flaws only and not at um, possibility and potential. And I also want to remind you that as, as researchers, as, as scientists, part of what we are trained to do and built to do is to examine things closely and critique them, right? So that is just another, another layer to all of this. And so the, the antidote to that, in my opinion, is to go way, way back to the basics and ask yourself what it is that you love about your research. Why did you want to embark on this career in the first place? Why does it matter to you? What is exciting about it to you? What, what are you curious about? What are you passionate about? All of those things, right? That can help you tune back into why you're here, why you're good at what you do. And that hopefully is enough to, to kickstart you in that writing process. And also remember, in the very, very early stages, you don't need to show this to anybody. These early dump drafts, what I call them, are just for you. So that might also help kind of get over some of that stuckness, is just remembering that in the very, very early stages of writing an AIMS page, you're the only one who's going to see it. So kind of lowering the bar for yourself and letting it be terrible, letting it be bad, um, giving yourself that permission to just let it be awful can also help you get unstuck so that eventually you can get it to a point where you can um, 
hand it off to somebody for feedback. And the last thing I will say here, I know I've gone on for a while about this, but this is the stuff that I, I really love to talk about. The last thing to remember here is when you are asking for feedback from someone on the concept of what it is that you're doing, I just want you all to remember that not everybody is well suited to seeing your idea in its infancy, right? These, these little baby seedlings of research ideas are very delicate and you don't want to hand it over to somebody who's just going to stomp on it and kill it. Okay. You need to be really discerning about who gets to see that little baby seedling of a research idea, because you want to find someone who can look at that little baby seedling and help you nurture it. It doesn't mean that they're going to tell you that it's perfect and just keep doing what you're doing. You want somebody who will give you frank and honest feedback about how to improve that idea, but who's not going to come in and say, that's terrible. That's not fundable. Don't ever try that. You'll never succeed because all that's going to do is make you want to give up. Right? So my final piece of advice here is to just be really discerning about who gets to see that early, early seedling of an idea so that you can nurture it and grow it. Uh, Sarah, you're not supposed to see the Q&As, only I can see them, so we're good. Uh, let me see if there are any other questions that I can answer today. Okay, so how do you approach critiques of the overall importance of the problem that you are trying to solve, i.e. grant reviewers that are obviously not in the same field? Great question. This is something that we get into in a lot more depth. So I have an actual full course on how to write an R01 grant that walks through all of this strategically. And I'll just give you the first piece of this, okay? So when you are talking about the overall importance of the problem that you are trying to solve, you really need to think about the audience who is receiving that, right? So if you're saying that these are reviewers who are obviously not in the same field, there are two ways to handle this. One is that you're, you're, this is, these are the wrong people to be looking at this grant. Like these are not the people who should be reviewing this grant. Um, but if these are the only people who are available to review this grant, then your job is to educate them to sort of bring them up to speed on your world so that they do understand the significance and importance of what you're doing. So that's a that's a strategic question. And that's something that we get into in depth in, in the full course that I teach. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth's question is, how much paradigm shifting can you propose before someone tells you to go to a different cocktail party? Uh, great question, Elizabeth. Um, again, this is something like we're really talking about innovation here, right? And that's something that we that we don't actually get into a lot on the Ames page, interestingly enough. Um, it is something that you can talk about, but I would not I would not use words like paradigm shifting in a names page. Um, and in fact, I would probably not use words like paradigm shifting uh, anywhere in your grant. Save that for the paper. Um, but I but what I want you to notice about that again is is your your audience and and how you frame it. And remembering that the folks who are reviewing your application are very likely the, um, the, the keepers of the current paradigm, right? And so you always want to be um, judicious in the way that, you're, that you talk about shifting paradigms or, or taking you know, dramatically new approaches to something. Um, but that is, an, that is an excellent question. Um, just sending a comment, joining the conversation is such a great analogy. Yeah, that is one that has stuck with me for a very long time. It's been so useful to me. And, and actually, the, the one of the reasons that I love it so much is, is it's one of the ways that you can sort of like lower the pressure a little bit, I think. Remembering that at its best, the, the scientific literature is uh, a conversation among peers, right? A conversation among colleagues. It can often feel really adversarial, both grant writing and, you know, manuscript writing. But um, when done well, 
Um, and, and when we're looking at this in the, in its most ideal form, which admittedly, um, is not really the reality, um, but in its ideal form, it is meant to be this conversation. It's a bunch of scientists saying, look, I did this cool thing. And now we get to do this other cool thing. And somebody else saying, oh yeah, I can use that too. And it just, it's, it's really beautiful when you think about it like that, even though the reality is much more complex, uh, than that, but to me, even just thinking about it that way, while also understanding the the realities of the situation does help kind of lower the pressure when it comes to, um, you know, putting your work out in the world. Uh, yeah, Brian said the same thing. Cocktail party analogy of joining the conversation is helpful to pull the thread. Members of a study section are probably not already members of our particular scientific conversation. Yeah. Um, so do we need to table set for a grant reviewer the conversation we live in? What are examples of how to do that? So again, this is, this is something that we're going to be getting in tomorrow with this framework is, is setting that table. And, and, and I think of it as framing, right? And so the, the way to think about this is, um, you're sort of educating your reviewers, you're bringing them up to speed on your world. And we always want to remember that our reviewers are highly intelligent, um, but, but sort of ignorant to what we're doing, right? So we're not, we're not treating them like they're idiots, because they're not. But we are respecting that they have not been immersed in this world in the same way that we have. They're also tired, hungry, stressed, and they're doing this as volunteers. Okay, so that's probably a good place to end it today and to set the stage for tomorrow where we will be getting into this crucial framework um, for how to really set the stage for the project that you are proposing. So I'm just going to pull up that slide uh, to orient you to what we are doing tomorrow. Uh, do, 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 do. So tomorrow we will cover how to approach the all important opening section of your aims page. We will get into the problem gap hook solution framework. Brian, that's the framework that I was mentioning. Uh, and we will also talk about how to provide a high level description of the importance of your research so that you can convince even the most skeptical reviewers. So that's what's on tap tomorrow. Uh, I hope to see most, if not all of you again. Um, and if there are any final questions before we wrap up today, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but I do hope that all of you will go off and do your homework. Glad you found it helpful, Sarah. Excellent. All right, everybody. Uh, Enjoy your homework and uh, I will see you tomorrow. We will be sending out a quick email uh, once the recording is up in the course area. And uh, if you do prefer to listen to that lesson instead of watch it, we do actually have a private podcast feed for you. So if you haven't subscribed to that, there'll be a link for that in your email as well. So there you go for today and uh, see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody.